life. Good morning, son. How are you? Skies above. Gee, it's great to be alive and love. Good, good, good morning, son. Good. Good, good, good morning, son. And good morning. Hope you're doing well. Today I wanted to do a uh, non-structured overview showing some things that I have learned about uh, Docker networking and specifically Docker networking related to Business Central containers. Uh, <clears throat> it's looking a little bright. Okay, well, we'll go with this. So um, I have been wanting to kind of customize the way that the Business Central container networks are configured so that I can have a centralized server, uh, very much how today I have a centralized Hyper-V server and I RDP, use RDP to connect to those virtual machines. I want to essentially have the same thing with Docker. I want a centralized server. I want to be able to have two, five, ten Docker containers running on that host. And I want to be able to connect to those Docker, BC Docker containers and develop against them using my desktop, my laptop, a VM, whatever I want. If I'm mobile, um, I want to be able to VPN into my network and be able to work with uh, the Docker containers hosted in my office. I also want to be able to do, I, I think how this works is, I want to be able to do Azure pipelines based off of my Docker host and not have to have them running on an Azure VM in the cloud or do everything on my laptop. So basically that's the idea. And you know, you may have different requirements or preferences, but this is kind of what I'm going to try to go for. So with that, I don't have a specific agenda, just going to show some things that I'm playing with and learning. And um, I am going to work on getting it documented and kind of organized and assembled in a meaningful way. But for now, I'm just going to show what I've been playing with and what seems to work. And um, thank you to Jeremy Visca, who helped me figure out the last significant portion. I had made some progress, but I was stuck on a few concepts and he helped resolve those. So thank you, Jeremy, for that. And let's go break some stuff. So here is my Docker server, my Docker host. And you see that I have a, a single container called Dev1. And I'm just going to start to work with that. So if I ping Dev1, Great, I can get a response from that. Notice the IP address is 172.31.88.165. It's one of those random Docker IP addresses. And this IP address will change every time you restart the machine. So if you're just using dev1 and resolving against that, that's fine, that should work. Your host file should get updated when necessary. But I don't like the 172 and that address is not reachable um, 
off of this host. So if I want to develop on my laptop, have VS Code on my laptop, and I want to publish to Dev1, I can't do that because my network has no idea what 17231 address is. So I want to put my Docker containers on a subnet that I control, issue IP addresses, control the issuance of IP addresses to my Docker containers such that I know what the IP address is for Dev1 and that I get proper name resolution and my laptop can talk to Dev1 even though it's not, you know, it's not part of this host. It's separate. It's on the same network, but it is not on this host. So there we have Dev1. And of course, as always, um, the BC Container Helper, Nav Container Helper, that build process ensures that we have an entry in the Windows host file. So that helps with name resolution as well. So what does it take to give this Dev1 container a different IP address, put it on a different subnet, make it accessible outside of this host? And so here's what I've learned. Let's do... Um, Docker network ls. So this lists the available Docker networks. And I had two, I think. I had this NAT, which is a default um, network address translation network that I guess gets created by default by Docker. And then I think I had this none. Um, I haven't really looked into that, but NAT none. Now I added this one called NAT one just for testing and I'll explain that a little further. So let me just get rid of that actually. Um, network RM NAT one. And this takes a few seconds, at least on Windows. When it removes that, it seems to um, interrupt my network connection. Uh-oh. There we go. And then it comes back. So it has some, it affects the Windows network driver in some manner. So let's try this again. Network LS. I've got NAT and none. Sounds like a comic book twins or, or uh, buddies or something like that. So we have NAT and none. And NAT is used by default by our Docker containers. So I can still ping. That's that 17231 address. Great. So how do I give my Docker container, uh, show it that I wanted to use a different network IP address range? So there is a command called network, Docker network create. So this is saying, hey Docker, you don't know anything about my network. This is my interpretation, my, my simple way of thinking about it. Docker, you don't know anything about my physical network, so let me tell you about it. And so I'm going to create what they call a transparent network. I haven't yet read up on, on why it's called transparent or that there's some uh, significance to that name, but it's just called a transparent network versus a NAT network. And there's one other type I don't know yet. And I'm going to tell it that this subnet of my network is 192.168.25. So that's the subnet of my office machines. And I'm going to put a zero there, and it is a slash 24 subnet, meaning that, as Jeremy explained to me, that that indicates a class C, and technical story behind that, but I now understand what slash 24, that's equivalent to like the Windows version of 255.255.255.0 for the subnet mask. And I want to specify the gateway as dot one, and I'm going to name that new network Net1. Very original, I know. So I just press Enter, and it creates this network called Net1 with this subnet. Did that work? There we go. And it takes a few seconds for on my machine to create that. And come on. Okay, so it's resetting the network on my VM or on my host. Okay, there we go. So it says, great, I've created that and this is the, in, it's like an internal Docker network ID. So now I can do a Docker, I think it's network inspect. Oh, oops, net one. Okay, 
So this is Docker Network Inspect Net1. Tell me about this network, Docker. So here's the name, there's the ID, and it is a transparent network using Windows drivers. And there is my subnet, there is my gateway address, and cool, it's available. That looks good. So now I've told Docker about my uh, network, this IP address range that I wanted to be aware of. But my BC container is only set up to talk to the NAT network. And so it got an IP address, it's talking to that NAT network, my host can talk to the container, and they're happy. But I want to tell my Docker container about this bigger world of my physical network. So not just on the host, but hey, there's an entire network out here, go forth young Docker container and explore. In order to do that, we need to connect the Docker container to the new network that we just told Docker about. And to do that, I'm going to, I think I called my container dev1. There we go. So I am going to use a command called Docker network connect saying, Hey, container dev1, hey you, there's this big world out here. I want you to connect to this network that I've set up with your, your ecosystem of Docker. And a critical distinction that I didn't know about till this morning, <coughs> and there are probably a dozen ways to do this, but for now, I'm going to specify a static IP address on my network subnet because um, I, I don't yet know of a, I haven't yet learned how to do a clean way to do DHCP just for Docker so that it has its own network range. I'm sure it's possible, but I haven't figured that out. And I think I'll wanna do this anyway so that I control the static IP address assignment going forward, put a DHCP reservation in there and have name resolution throughout my network. So I think this is the simpler way and it's certainly simpler for testing. So I'm saying, hey, Docker uh, container dev1, I want you to connect to this Docker network called net1. And let's give that a try. That went pretty quickly. Now, let's see what happens. Um, where's the command? Okay, so let's do a Docker inspect on my container. And notice now my dev1 container, it still has its NAT IP address, but it now has a second IP address. So it is dual homed or it, it is aware of both networks right now. So it can talk on the NAT network or it can talk on my office subnet. Very cool. So I can still do ping 172.31.88.65, or oops, 165. Okay, so I still get a response on the NAT IP address. Let's do a ping 192.168.25.181. Yep, 181. So now I get a reply on 181. Very cool. Now, if I do a ping dev1, it is still Windows is still resolving to the 172 address because my host file still has that address. So that's what it knows. That's what it's using for its name resolution. Now, if even if I do uh, IP config flush DNS and then I ping it again, it's still going to look up initially in that host. That's totally fine. I'm going to work on doing uh, name resolution on the 192 address on my um, network level and get a reservation in there so that other machines on my network can resolve this. But now if I open this browser, I was doing some other testing, but what I can do is I can go to my dev1 container slash bc and i am using the new bc container helper which does a multi-tenant install 
uh, multi tenant creates multi tenant containers by default. So I have to, I've learned this morning, I have to specify question mark tenant equals default, um, or I need to specify a tenant in order for this to work. So when I do that, I get good resolution and it signs in, shows me the sign in prompt. And let me just make sure my sign in works. And excellent. So that is presumably using the 117 whatever NAT uh, network address. That's fine. So now what if I want to take that and, okay, come on, just do a new tab and I'm just going to take this and instead of using dev1, Let's substitute in my 192 address. Look at that. So this tells me that that container is successfully receiving traffic on that IP address. So fantastic. So if I send it a request on the NAT address, it works. If I send it in on my new 192 subnet, it works. Now the next test is, what if I launch a browser on a different machine? So this is a browser on my desktop. So uh, this right here is an uh, RDP session to uh, my Docker server. And I'm just going to drag a browser over from my desktop onto this monitor. And I'm going to do the same thing. Now Dev1 should not resolve because I don't, wow, okay. I think that uh, uh, Jeremy explained that Windows may be doing some uh, NetBIOS name resolution across my network. So it actually worked. I'm surprised. I thought I would be able to have to do IP address. Look at that. So now from my desktop, I am able to hit my do BC Docker container running on a different machine. It's exposed on my network. I can connect to it. Now, I can also just, just to verify it's the right one, 168, 25, 181. Look at that. So I can hit it by IP address as well. Okay, very cool. And I'll test with my laptop separately, but I'm assuming this will work. Now, uh, Jeremy shared a very important tip about this. This will work fine or should work fine, appears to work fine for a Windows environment because Windows is doing some NetBIOS work behind the scenes to get this to resolve. So in this case, Dev1, Windows is figuring out through NetBIOS, ah, I know that that is a 192 address. And let me just see if I can check that. So this is a DOS command uh, prompt on my desktop. And let's do nbt stat. And I want to look at the cache. Huh, look at that. I wonder how it's doing it. Okay. So I, it, it's not caching it but somehow it knows how to get to that machine. Fascinating. I'll have to look into that to see how it's doing that. It doesn't, it's not showing up in NBT stat at least. So it's using some trickier method to um, do that name resolution. But anyway, Jeremy's point was that if you have a Mac on your network, in his experience, it will not resolve because it doesn't have the kind of the, the duct tape and twine uh, improvised name resolution that Windows uses uh, for these uh, system names. So in, in that case, if you have mixed environments, so if you have Mac OS X, if you have Android, iOS, other platforms, Linux, and devices you need to access 
these containers on your network, you will need to have a uh, more proper formal name resolution system. So for that, I'm going to test, um, I have a unified network, so I have a separate 10 dot um, subnet that I'm going to set up for that network, have my containers use static IPs on that network, and I'll do DHCP reservations. Um, okay, so um, thank you. Uh, Sasha, I believe it was, Sasha Herman, um, recommended trying IP config display DNS. Let's try that. So IP, oh, wrong machine. Did I close my, okay, let me try that again. So this is IP config slash display DNS. Whoa, okay, so I've got a stuff on, bunch of stuff on here. So let me try um, just flushing it, see if I can, rather than sorting through that, um, Okay, flush DNS. Okay, so now let me go back to my Edge browser, F5. Okay, so it's still working. So let's see if that gets an entry in IP config. Wow, that's a lot of noise there. Google API, G static. SharePoint. Hmm. No, I'm not seeing it. Um, so I'll have to do some more research and see. But the, the point is, if you're using other platforms other than Windows, you may not be able to resolve this without a more formal um, name resolution solution. So um, Yes, uh, so Sasha says that um, the what you're seeing in NBT stat or I, uh, IP config may not match what the browser is caching. And, and Jeremy actually uh, made the same observation. Um, I've, in my previous videos, I've shown situations where Chrome resolves even though I cannot ping the container name on my host machine. So I can, can, I can ping the IP address I cannot ping the container name, so it's not resolving, yet Chrome worked fine. And so I, in that case, that's the episode where I had to do IP config flush DNS in order to remove those entries and then Windows re-resolve from hosts. So there's something funky going on. But with other platforms, you may not get this to work um, with this container name. So you may need to have, uh, you know, a DHCP reservation or a DNS entry of some form so that those machines um, can uh, access these names of your containers. And yes, uh, Sasha was the one who gave me that clue last time to use flesh DNS. Uh, it was because my browser worked fine. Strangely, it was Chrome. It somehow magically resolved the container name, even though Windows could not ping it and VS Code could not publish to that host name. Um, I could work with IP address, but not the host name. And it's some quirk that there are a dozen or more scenarios where Windows does not properly use the entry in the Windows host entry file. And you have to flush DNS or do some other, you know, gyrations to get it to work. So, so this is cool. So now I am able to access this dev1 container from my separate desktop browser. This is awesome. Now, I, I delayed this process for months because I took an initial look at Docker networking. It is just painful to try to figure out how to orient yourself. And what's kind of ironic is the process is relatively simple. You have the command to create a network to tell Docker, hey, by the way, there's this thing called a network and it has this IP address range. And then you connect it to your container. Say, hey, container, connect to this new network, which it can. You don't even need to disconnect it from NAT. You don't need to delete the NAT network, which I saw in another blog post because they had problems with some other commands. And it just works. Um, now, the key I will say is when you do the connect, at least so far, I, I wanted to do a static IP. Otherwise, Docker will assign 
the first available, a random IP, not quite sure what its mechanism is, but uh, it will assign, in my case, it assigned dot three, and that would have been an IP address conflict. So, so far I'm going with static until I can get my 10.1 set up. Now, um, let's give that a try. Okay, so here I have Docker network, let me just clear, Docker network LS. Now, I haven't tried this before. This is on my to-do list that I need to do next. So we've got net one. So I'm going to create a new network called net two. And I'm actually, I'm going to make it 10 0 0 1 because that's what I've set up in my Unify network for testing. Okay, so I'm going to use a 10 0 0 subnet and that'll be a kind of a class C blocked off. So there's only 255 addresses. I'm going to call that net two. I'm going to create that so that Docker says, Docker's aware of this new network created it nice and seamless. And I'm now wondering if the interrupt I'm getting is because I was using 192.168.25, which is the same network as the host. Good to know. I didn't get disconnected that time. So now that I have this net two, I'm going to do a static IP address of 10.0.0 five connect tell say hey docker connect dev one to the net two network and use a static ip ip address of 10 cool so uh i always forget the commands docker how do i get the oh there we go Docker inspect, okay. Docker inspect dev one, get the IP addresses. Now I have three IP addresses assigned to this container. So let me pull up my desktop browser and let's try 10, 0, 0, 5, slash BC question mark tenant equals default. Okay, so this is not surprising because I literally just created this network in my uh, Unify um, controller, Unify network configuration, and it is a VLAN. So I suspect that the traffic is blocked. So let me see what happens if I can change that. So I'm going to go into my Unify interface and I haven't, I'm not an expert on this, but what I'm going to try is I'm going to try to edit this. I'm going to remove the VLAN, see if that allows the traffic to flow unimpeded. Oh, it's required. Okay. So now, okay, so fine. Let me cancel that. So it has to be a VLAN on these additional networks. So I'm going to go into firewall. Firewall and LAN in, create a new rule, accept. So this is um, one nine, I forgot what my networks are called. Okay, let me just screenshot this and routing and firewall. So I am going to I'll, um, go to firewall, LAN in, and I'm going to do a new rule to, and this is um, LAN to dev. That's the name of my new test network. Going to accept all traffic and I don't know if these are required, but I always do them. Any IP address to any port group and destination any. So a very wide open rule. 
and let me just move this up. So that's my land to dev. Okay. And that takes a minute to provision. So um, unfortunately, that's one minor downside I found is provisioning of the the USG 3P firewall device um, security gateway. Whenever you make a single change, it takes several minutes to provision. So let me scoot that back over there. And what I can do is I should be able to try a ping. So this is from my desktop 10.0.0.5. Okay. And I want a ping dash T. Okay. Okay. So I'll just see if that starts to open up. It is still provisioning. So now let me try that IP address on my host. So copy that from my desktop. Let's go over to my host. Okay, so my host does not know how to resolve that either. So I might need to do some additional work to get that to resolve. So I'll need to do a route or whatever it's called on my host to be aware of this additional network. And it may not be able to. It may need to go out to my security gateway, get instructions on how to get to that machine. And actually, that's another question. If Docker is running on this IP address, does my host is that possible to run Docker on a different subnet than what I have configured for my host? So my host Docker server, oops, v ethernet. Oh, I need to uninstall Hyper-V from here. I think that's why it's doing this. Yeah, my host is 192.168. Okay, so anyway, uh, the point was to show you that after hours of um, trying to research this and just being absolutely confused by Docker networking, it's just a few commands and it's pretty simple. With, with a simple scenario, like same subnet, it actually works and Windows figures out some of the initial name resolution and I just need to do some network housekeeping. And so Sasha asked, does the unified controller automatically route between these networks? Um, no, I don't believe so because when you set up the additional network, it requires that that be set up as a VLAN and those VLANs by default are isolated. No traffic will flow between them. So I did, um, I had to go in the firewall and tell it to allow traffic between the network segments, um, which I did, but it is still provisioning. So it's basically having to reboot and reconfigure based on those new firewall rules, which takes a few seconds. So, um, and that was in here. And I am not an expert on this. I just know just enough to get stuff to work. I'm sure my firewall rules are abysmal, but, um, here, what I did is I set up this LAN to dev. Now, oh, what I, I probably need to do a dev to LAN. I don't know if it needs to be two-way, but let me just try that. No, this is a source. Oh, there we go. Destination dev. Land to dev. Maybe I did that wrong. Dev. IPv4 subnet. Source. Network. Okay, so I probably did this wrong. So let's go from LAN to dev. Save. Okay. Then just in case, I'll create one dev to LAN uh, to provide two-way. And I'm going to accept traffic all and network. 
Let's go back from dev to network LAN. Okay, let me drag that up. Okay, so I've LAN to dev, dev to LAN, and now it has to reprovision, unfortunately. Um, so uh, Sasha asks uh, whether, so the, does the firewall define what's allowed to flow, but a, a separate route defines how the packets would flow? And based on my experience, um, I do not need to have a, a static route or anything defined. Um, so for instance, my office LAN, 192.168, I've got a home and a guest network here. And so these are our three separate subnets. These two are VLAN out. And I have not had to do a routing rule. So I have zero static routes. Um, and all I've had to do is enable um, or set up firewall rules. So for instance, Bonjour for Apple printing land to home, home to land. I've had to do that, and, and just through the firewall rules, uh, that works um, strangely. I, I got it to work. Um, maybe there's a way to do static routes, but what this allows me to do is uh, have more granular control over the traffic that flows between the networks. So it's actually worked out perfectly for me because I only allow specific ports between my home and office network and um, the guest. I don't allow any traffic. Okay, so let's see if this is provisioned. Probably not. Provisioning still. Okay. And this is my desktop browser, I think. Nope, that's the host. Okay. So the 10 dot I need to work on, which I fully expected. Plus, I need to um, find where in Unify I can do like a DHCP name reservation uh, with that static IP, which I think facilitates... Um, uh, name resolution on alternate devices. So if I want to pull it up on my iPad, I want it to be able to resolve. If I'm on the 192 network, I want it to be able to resolve on the 10 dot network. And um, so that's just housekeeping, which I'm assuming is possible. But there may be some deal breaker. Maybe there's some reason why this container on a 192 host cannot easily um, connect to the 10 dot, or maybe I need to do some extra uh, routing on this host to make that happen, something like that. But the bigger breakthrough, which, uh, I mean, if I was stuck with 192, I'd be thrilled, is to give this container a 192 address and to be able to say, hey, I'm on a different machine, dev1, bc, tenant, this right there, that was exactly what I've been wanting. And I'm willing to live with limitations if I can't figure it out. Very cool. So it's not as hard as I thought. It, it definitely seemed hard. Uh, the learning curve is, is not easy. Uh, the, the blog posts and the documentation will take you in 10 different directions. And if the blog post is older than three months old, you have no idea whether any of those commands or approaches actually work anymore, given changes in Docker and Windows and um, other things. But it does work. This is very cool and takes me a step closer to having the centralized Docker server that I can access so that I can just use VS Code on my laptop without having to have Docker locally because my laptop just doesn't have the horsepower to really serve up Docker very well. So... That was it. That was the uh, crash course. And um, I'm going to um, contribute this to some documentation that uh, Jeremy is working on to um, figure all this out for Docker networking for BC containers and get it published so that people can actually follow it and understand it, understand it as a how-to guide. So with that, have a great weekend. This was awesome figuring out. I'm super happy, super stoked, and enjoy. I'm going to go watch some F1 or maybe go to the beach. So have a good one. How do I, how do I get out of this room? Um, here we go.
Jeeps 